Um, today I'm going to present um, one slice of a monograph that I've written with Paul Atkinson on creating conditioning. I just want to start off just by setting our perspective here, really. Um, we come from a perspective that really conditions are created, they're not really discovered. Um, yes, they are based on real phenomena, people suffer, there are underlying biological things going on, but the nature of that reality is subject to interpretation. So conditions are not produced, uh, uh, so rather conditions are produced through acts of description, recognition, definition, and classification. But these entities are rarely stable, rather than this ongoing process of redefinition and reconceptualization. And even long-standing conditions can see this process of conditions repeatedly change. Fashions occur, things, conditions change, and um, tinkering around the signs of conditions often happen. So Paul and I carried out with a number of colleagues um, a body of work looking at the work of the clinical genetics team and how they diagnose and classify genetic syndromes. I think there is a huge number of genetic syndromes out there. So how do they do the practical work of classifying people into um, a, 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 di a genetic diagnosis of a, a genetic syndrome? Um, and this looks at the wide range of them. So, and around that time, there's a lot of debate and discussion around the, the transformative nature of genetics on, on diagnosis and classification, particularly around um, genetic syndrome. So, after looking at this broad range of conditions, we really thought, well, what are the actual effects of genetic knowledge on one syndrome? If genetics has that kind of power, maybe we should look at one case in particular. What are the effects of genetic knowledge on one syndrome and what is it thought to constitute? So, to do that, we decided to follow the phenomena. And I carried out a three year ethnography, um, tracing the multiple sites and versions, of course, not all the sites, but the ones that I, I could follow, um, of one syndrome. And this provides us with a, a, snapshot, a snapshot of time and mapping some of the multiple sites and versions in which this one medical condition is enacted and represented. So we looked at the local clinical and scientific team and then followed them out to look at the, um, in the um, uh, UK and international scientific um, conference circuit and also the activist circuit. And then back to the families who are caring for a daughter with the syndrome. So we followed the work of the clinician, scientists, activists and others in the construction of the syndrome to provide a detailed case study on the effects of genetic knowledge on this syndrome or what it's thought to constitute. So our condition was Rett syndrome and this is a severe neurodevelopment uh, disorder that causes profound intellectual development um, disability in girls. Uh, first described by Andreas Rett, but really first came to prominence in his English language account published in 1977 and from then that's where the debates in literature started to emerge about identifying these girls. And the classic definition is the key features are after a period of normal development you get no loss of intellectual functioning and motor and coordination skills. Um, this is um, a period of progression so after about 12 to 18 months an apparently normal child will lose its skills. You also get deceleration of head growth development of stereotypic hand movements, and um, additional features include seizures, disturbed breathing patterns, and scoliosis of the spine. So, as we know, this is a classic textbook form of knowledge, as the big Fleck helpfully pointed out. But they embody just one form, a static version of medical knowledge, an ideal type. But they cannot reveal the competing interests that give rise to disputed scientific or clinical definitions. And of course, all the symptoms, the key features I pointed out, are actually highly contested once you start to look at the literature. It can't kept to capture the networks and alliances that are mobilised in promoting particular conditions, so the scientific field and also the activist network, or taking into account the practical work of the clinician in um, recognising and describing the condition in particular patients. And the textbook of course is equally silent on the multiple interpretations that are put on a condition, any condition, by a patient. And in this case, in terms of RET, family members, parents caring for a child. So we thought we need to look beneath the surface and look at the many um, stages, 
of other sites where the syndrome is enacted to look at how they make sense of the, the syndrome. So there is a key moment associated with the syndrome, which is why we chose it, because at the time, uh, the, um, a key moment in the trajectory was the discovery of a gene, or mutations in a gene associated with the syndrome. And who does Who you can see here, um, a very powerful and glamorous scientist in the field of Rett syndrome and also in MECP2 science, uh, made this discovery, her team, and since then, <coughs> MECP2 testing became available for children with Rett syndrome or suspected Rett. And our local clinic was the first to offer MECP2 testing in the UK, and they have a, um, a specialist clinic um, that were offering uh, testing for anyone in the UK with Rett or suspected Rett. And of course, every medical entity has a history or trajectory implying a progression from ignorance to understanding, model to clarity, belief to science. And this narrative of steady progress really does fit with the Rett story. And this story of genetic resolution was very powerful in Rett syndrome. Now we have MECP2 chest testing, we can classify and be very clear the children with Rett syndrome. We'll take out the clinical um, discussions there, and we can fix it. And this story of resolution was very seductive to those outside the inner circle of expertise. Clinicians who may, may just have one or two patients with su suspected RET. And we often find within these allied fields of clinical specialism, these narrative exists, presenting identification of MECP2 um, as resolving all the issues of classification for RET syndrome. And here we can see this played out in, by a pediatrician in the European Scientific Conference on Rett Syndrome. So he says, um, I'm a relatively newcomer to Rett. You can see this from his, his, his description, his speech. Um, Andreas Rett observed two children in a waiting room, naming it Rett. In the 80s and 90s, there was a diagnostic dilemma, struggling with trying to identify the core symptoms of the syndrome. The breakthrough with Zogby and his team. So he also shows his, his newness to the field because he doesn't realise Zogby is a, is a woman. <laughs> um, he also says that you know, they identified the MECP2 mutation, actually it's mutations of the MECP2 gene. Um, since then, over 200 mutations have been identified. This resolved the diagnostic criteria. And he then goes on to describe the, the, the classic definition of the features of, of Rett syndrome. So we demonstrate the impact of these technologies, this hope for simplification, steady progress, for more knowledge, and it's very seductive. And I also found this in a lot local clinical and scientific team. Um, they were also really hopeful that by looking at these cases of Rett from across the UK and doing the um, mutation testing, they could really um, identify and refine that fit between the, cl the clinical diagnostic criteria and the mutation. They can make that and really fix what that condition would be and how that mutation related to particular features of the syndrome. So that was their goal as a clinical and scientific team. So they really felt they had handled that and could really make that work. But of course, Unfortunately for them, but great for us as social scientists, they're not quite that simple. Um, new technologies do not simply fit, appear and transform the syndrome. Technologies are often discontinuous in their, their use, jerky, not smooth transitions, new explanatory systems, uneven and patchy, and here we can see the local and global playing out very nicely. And also messy redrawing and regrouping of boundaries and diseases. So, what this did was introduce a lot of challenges. This, this um, MECP2 um, gene challenges the field um, more widely in terms of science and clin clinical field, but also our local clinical team. How can they develop a stable model of the classification? And how do they manage the variation and instability within a diagnostic category of RET? How does this um, mutation testing, what does it do? How can they make it and fix it rather than it actually in it, um, increase the messiness how will it help them to fix and classify this syndrome more closely? So uh, I'm just going to present really the clinical work, looking at the clinical work of the team today.
Um, but what we found, really, by looking at the clinical team, was that these innovations in biomedical knowledge, this, this genetic test, has not supplanted the practical and interpretive work of the clinician in adjudicating cases and the diagnosis of Rett syndrome. And these clinical entities are made in the clinic just as they are in the laboratory or the textbook. And we found some key processes in the trajectory of this genetic condition within the clinic. And of course, these aren't unique or novel things that we found, but things that we've identified in, in our work. Naming, claiming, boundary work, lumping and splitting, simplification and complication, and also preserving of the category, the core categories. I'm just going to go through these in turn. So, naming and claiming the problem of fixing the classification. So, despite that promise, there isn't a simple one-to-one -one correspondence between the site of the genetic anomaly and the physical features of the syndrome. The classic genotype-phenotype problem that is always one of those things that the field is struggling with. How do we align these two? Because, of course, what you find is, although there is this drive to use this mutation testing to define the child, and the classification, what you find is that a large proportion of girls who have clinically classic Rett syndrome do not have the mutation, or has not, is not even been yet identified through some technology, so they don't have it. But also, you find individuals who have an FP2 gene who appear clinically unaffected or have a very different set of clinical problems. So where do you, how do you make that work? So this is what the field and the local clinical team are struggling with. And despite the promise for the clinical team, um, the genetic testing does not really align to provide definitive answers for them. And here, the consultant geneticist, it's one of the early clinics where they were really excited about using this test and really hoped that it had held a lot of promise for them in their clinical work. And he starts off by saying, uh, the child has a 1162 to 1172 deletion. He's very confident, pretty compatible with classic RET. And the parents, actually, what they really want is help with the prognosis. What's going to happen to my child? Are they going to remain stable? Or are they going to... Are, are they going, can, is their condition going to get worse? What's, what's going to happen to them? <coughs> and as this, this discussion unfolds, um, I must point out each consultation is about an hour long, sometimes longer. So I'm really condensing large clinical data into tiny little gaps here, little bits here, snippets. Um, so they really want to know, well, what, what does that mean for, for my child? And actually, you then have to back down quite a bit about what this genetic knowledge can provide. Actually, not a lot. Well, there is, as you know, a, a huge range of ability in Rett syndrome. And even with children with the same mutation, there's a huge spectrum <coughs> of variability. And um, he has to admit, resulting genetic knowledge don't seem to be predictive and the ways in which uh, the syndrome will impact on the child or severity. So here then the test, I think it was the top of the parent, but also the, the clinician. He wants it, they, they want it desperately to give them that extra information, but it doesn't quite pay off. And also, um, the clinical boundaries between adjacent conditions with Rett syndrome as well are often nebulous and must be um, adjudicated using the practical work of the clinic. They can't rely on the, the genetic test alone, but often these conditions are very, very nebulous. So how do they make that decision? These parents are keen to have a MECP2 test for their son who has Angelman, but what will that tell them? But actually, clinically, they still have the problem of drooling and dribbling, which is a feature of Angelman syndrome, but also in Rett syndrome. So where do they, where do they go with this, this um, diagnosis? This is a process where really there's a major role for expert judgment, and they, this, um, this case isn't um, resolved, it goes on, because actually they can't align these, these things. Where does this child sit? There's also a lot of um, the importance of developing expertise in, in doing this boundary work. And the clinical team were very keen to explore any case that sat at those edges where there was that problem of diagnostic fit. Uh, this was about developing their own expertise. 
the more rare cases, the unusual cases you have in your caseload, that adds to your expertise to be able to, to say and make those judgments about where that child sits. So here we have Marcus, a six-year-old boy, um, we suspected <coughs> Rett syndrome. And of course they're very keen to test him because it, a boy would be a very unusual case to have for this syndrome, mainly girls. So if the child has um, the MECA2 test, and that really adds to their ability to, to make judgments about where the, the, um, the boundary of the syndrome. And similarly with Ruby, who's a high functioning girl, she has speech, some preserved speech, and also she can write her name. The team spent a lot of time working with her. And again, they're collecting these cases, so she's, um, she's videoed, she's photographed, she's videoed doing things, so that they actually can claim to have that. She is a rep case, and we can prove it with this. So there's a lot of working of, working of those cases up. But importantly, this boundary work, the centrality of clinical judgment is really so key to all of this. So here we have, um, and they have the power to fix the classification. So here we have Sophie. She's already got a positive genetic test result and has been given a label of Rett syndrome, but importantly by a paediatrician elsewhere, not one of the specialists in the team. And the, patient, the, the clinical team note the absence of one of the key features of Rett syndrome progression. And the parents are really not interested in the diagnosis, they're here for prognosis. What is the future for my child? But, and they're very clear, as far as they're concerned, she has Rett syndrome. However, the paediatrician calls it into question if it definitely is Rett. Now this hangs, this is a long consultation, it hangs in the room of what do we do with this? Nobody really responds to it, but it hangs there in the room. And right at the end of the clinic, the father makes a comment about pain and response, and the paediatrician immediately says, ah, fairly characteristic of Brett syndrome, and then it, it remains as a diagnosis. And through that we are revealed that she is the Rep Queen, she has the power to make these adjudications, she is the international expert. And in dysmorphology you have a lot of Queen's experts who have the power, so whether it's white matter or, um, or a particular syndrome, they can adjudicate. And the oracular, pro oracular pronouncements of the Rep Queen has a lot of power in this clinic. She could move a genetic diagnosis in or out. She had the power to make that fixed or to dismiss it. And importantly, the clinical team really started, well, they started out with the first clinics to really focus on the mutation testing. By the end of their time with the Rep, Rep Queen, they had pretty much moved to focusing on a clinical diagnosis as a key form. They took on her work, they embodied her description and the ways that she works in the clinic to make that and to fix diagnosis in that way. Um, so when I first meet her, she's just, she just tells me in this first clinic about, um, she talks me through the case notes. There is often some about the triggers, triggers it, classic red. And we start off with the, when the parents arrive, it's very much all about MECP2 testing. The parents want it, and the rest of the clinical team, four consultants and two SPRs, are scurrying around trying to work out about, have they got blood, what do they need, have they really had the test, there's a lot of work around this. But then, actually, when the Rex Queen says classic RET, that's the one that fixes it. Yes, they keep, they go on to look at um, taking a history, but actually her power to say is classic red, we don't need a test, that has the power, and actually the child doesn't have the MECP2 testing. The Red Queen has pronounced it, and that fixes the diagnosis. We also see lumping and splitting in Red syndrome as well. So of course this is a recurrent feature of systems of medical classification. So we have um, the emergence of rare variants, so early onset seizure, preserved speech variant we saw with Ruby, um, MECP2 mutations found in boys, which you saw with Marcus, and also familial cases. This, of course, is a, a de novo spontaneous mutation for Rett syndrome, but um, familial cases have now been identified. And also, as we get these communities grappling with these um, issues of how to stabilise the entity, 
We also get them aligning it with other, other um, things as well. So we have the emergence of other allied labels, so RET-like syndrome, MEPP2 duplication syndrome, but also it becomes aligned with a, a broader spectrum um, of other labels, so um, a wider spectrum of neurodevelopmental neuro disorders, so the autism spectrum. So it becomes, these things move around and as the, as the, the field is trying to work out where it fits and how these things can be made to, 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 to be fixed. And also you have different versions of the syndrome also persisting. So while in that clinic we had um, the Red Queen saying, from a classic point of view, she's absolutely classic, we don't need the tests. At the same time, around the same time, at an international conference, I speak to an Italian, Italian neurologist, he's saying, well, if they don't have the MEP2 mutation, I don't classify them as RET. But once she's exposed to the wider field, the experts, she then goes, well, I will now. Don't. So as she becomes more expert, the mutation testing becomes less important. But also, um, different versions of the syndrome are also promoted. So we have a syndrome promoted to policymakers as a common cause of learning disabilities, but also as a rare disease. We also have lobbying campaigns linking Rett syndrome or the MEP2 mutation to a wider range of common disorders. So bring it open, actually, if you give us funding, it has a wider implications, not just for this group, this small group, but for um, disorders affecting millions. It also becomes a condition that's also promoted as one that can be cured. Now there's a, we know the underlying mechanism, then perhaps we can reverse the effects, perhaps we can um, cure children with the syndrome. But that's another story. We also see simplification and complication. And complication. <laughs> um, so we see this, um, and you see this other diseases, this um, cyclical patterns of explanatory accounts. We first have this reductionist discourse of, yes, we can attribute this clinical entity to this underlying single cause, MEPP2, and attempt to remove any of the ambiguities and align the genotype and phenotype more closely. But cycles often return to more complex accounts. Actually, you can't fix this reductionist discourse. It doesn't work. The clinical teams, they want it so much to work, but actually it starts to fall apart in the clinic. And we find this, uh, these attempts to simplify um, the, um, uh, the syndrome, particularly with the, the local scientific team. You see it as well in the, in the broader scientific field. But in our local clinical team, it became really clear that they were really trying to calibrate RET. How can you make this ideal type work for science, not just for the clinic, but also to make the science work? It's really difficult. So they'd inherited a... Um, uh, a database from the Red Queen, who and they were very pleased to have this UK database, and they were really keen to start trying to align the clinical data they had on their patient population in the UK with the with the genotype. So they were trying to work out how to make that more closely. But they had really big problems. There were lots of silences in this, these meetings and a lot of sighing. So. They were trying to find a more objective way. And they were, how do we capture the variance of the clinical features, but also ensure it maps onto the genotype? And the, the database they had already uh, with, had been classified by the Red Queen in very particular ways. Importantly, she'd used her own expertise, her embodied knowledge of the syndrome, to make that, um, the look at sc scoring and the features, rather than the, um, the classic, um, in textbook version of Rett syndrome. They were actually quite different, but did give them some problems. But also, how, how to make it work for the science was very difficult for them. And um, so they were really trying to, to, how could they accurately represent this entity? And it kept slipping through their fingers. I don't think it gives us anything useful. These are crude measures. Can we be more objective? This may not be accurate either. Loud size. This it happened again and again. There's lots of loud size in my field notes. 
And that went on and on for you know, all the meetings that we had. Um, so try to make the ideal type work for science, not just for the clinic or, or for the child, but actually work for the science was very powerful. So, so what I want to say really is that a few points. The clinic is not simply a place where people fitted into these existing categories. Rather, this is where these um, categories are being fashioned and reshaped and made in the assembly of, um, not just in the assembly of the individual, but also it adds to that wider classificatory process. They contribute to the classificatory status of Brett syndrome itself. But also, also importantly, the clinical diagnosis and the expertise of the clinician still have the power to fix that classification. Despite this notion that the MET-PPT test will give us that knowledge, actually, that was <coughs> removed. The clinicians still have that power. And once the team had learned from the Red Queen, they too had the power to make that call. So importantly, the category of Red Syndrome, despite all of this new science and technology into the field, was still preserved. And the category of Rett syndrome still displays remarkable resilience. Um, we see it produced and reproduced in many sites within the clinical scientific literature, the expertise of the specialist, interpretation of families, but none completely supplants each other. They all exist and all add to each other. There's a complexity there of how they all inter intertwine and um, have an effect on each other. So we don't see new conditions. What we say we see is um, elaborations of the Rett syndrome, but it still has that power. I just want to make a final point on translation. It's very fashionable and does imply a movement, a strong movement from the laboratory, from research into the clinical domain, into medical practice. But these processes of translation are not so simple and linear. They're far more complex and messy. There are multiple circuits and sites where relationships between research, diagnosis, treatment, and social, social, social mobilization take place. And they're not linear. And they're more complex than just a, a, even a one or two way process. They're far more complex. There are circuits of translation. They're multiple and numerous and diverse. And I just hope that I've given you some insights and some, some of the, the complex processes that are often glossed as translation. Thank you.